Joy, being a wife to you is the greatest <laughs> joy of my life. I have, uh, I've come to get, uh, become quite fearful, and I thought I was going to be a bit afraid of following Craig after a session, but after James this afternoon, this stage is still trembling and glowing. Wasn't it great having James as his uh, inaugural, inaugural conference address? <clears throat> It's my time to uh, now finish. Uh, if, if, if you're anything like me, you, you just want to keep on doing this hour after hour. I know we have families, we have pets, we have homes, we have chores. We need to go home and get ready for church tomorrow. And uh, I hope you'll be there at yours, diligent, front row, praying and expectant. Uh, but it is time to bring it to a close. I want to revisit our aims. And if you can think with me, have we met them? Have we at least started our way towards achieving our aims for this conference over this weekend, and I'm so thankful to God that you've been with us. Thank you for taking your time, investing in, in uh, putting on a conference like this by both buying a ticket. Many of you have volunteered or helped or bought tickets for others as gifts, and we're thankful for that. Our aims for this conference was, first, to send sinners home justified and in a state of peace with God. I wonder if you've been here this whole conference and you know you are a sinner out of relationship with God in Christ and you have still not placed your faith in him. Do it today. There is nothing standing between you and God except for your unwillingness to believe his promise in the gospel. Believe. And if you have believed for the first time, whether you profess to believe before or not, please let somebody know so that we can pray with you, help you find a church and confirm God's promises to you. Our second aim has been to send Christians home revived. Now, that, that's a work only the Spirit can do. Just like salvation, revival or awakening to our former sleepiness, awaking so that Christ may shine on us, Ephesians 5 says, so that we have a burning desire to see Jesus magnified in ways not presently imaginable. Putting that in our hearts is something only the Spirit can do. But He uses His Word and He uses His preaching. And I hope, I hope that is begun in your soul. Thirdly, our aim was to send Christian leaders and preachers home challenged to repent of lethargy, challenged to repent of seeking man-made ministry and rather pursue supernatural ministry with supernatural results. I would say the only kind of ministry the New Testament knows Let's revisit, as we come to a close, what revival is. There's been lots of definitions handled. They're all really just iterations. I, I wasn't able to write down Craig's or Dr. Damon's or James's fast enough, so I'll just go back to the one that I started with, which is that revival is when, by the Father's sovereign timing, Jesus the Son extends his kingdom on earth by sending blessing and power to his church through the Spirit, so that the cross is preached, the church is made holy, and souls are saved in large number. The first thing that I want to send you home with, with our, our last session title, Revival and the Individual. What can you do? What can you do today, starting today, to get out of the way of God sending revival? What can you do? First of all, know what revival is. It is this. So... Baseline application, reject idiotic and infantile hype. Like the next time somebody says, I love revival too, or I'm praying for revival too, or the next time you pray for revival, stop yourself or stop your friend and say, what's revival? Because the name is not the thing. And the word revival does not mean that we're praying for the same thing. So you, start with you, know what revival is so you know what you're praying for, hoping for, and expecting. This means prioritize the preaching of Christ. I don't think there would be anything more alien to the New Testament, to Paul, to say that we are pursuing an ingathering of souls, that we're pursuing glorifying God and an outpouring of His Spirit, and the first main thing that we're leaving this room to go and do is not seeking and prioritizing either in our ministry, if you're a minister, minister in your speech, if you're a Christian, or in your pursuit, if you're a, 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 a member of a church, if we're not pursuing the preaching of Jesus Christ. We'll have no clue what we're aiming at or praying for if part of the application was not get to the preaching of Jesus as often as you can. Or preachers, pastors, allow me to say this to you. 
You must preach Christ always. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 and onwards, he says, Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and, and folly to the Gentiles. We preach Christ crucified. Can you say that? Does that, does that characterize your ministry? There's an old, I'm sure it's just a, a, a parable, but there's an old story about an old chapel in England, an old stone chapel which became a, uh, a, 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 a center of, of souls being saved, of church revitalization and strength, and missionaries went out from there. Many people were converted, and over the front archway doors was this stone lettering that says, we preach Christ crucified. And then... Next to the building, there was this beautiful garden and a vine. And over some years, the vine grew over the church, and it covered the word crucified. And it says, we preach Christ. And that church did preach Christ. It preached all about Jesus as a great example of humanitarianism. And as a great leader of humanity and, and moral ethics and servitude to the human race, they preached Jesus as an example, not as a substitute on the cross. And then the vine grew a little bit more and it said, we preach, not just Christ anymore, because Gandhi had some amazing things to say. And, and Muhammad had, had some insight into the human need and, and how to love through the blade. I don't know. That, we don't just preach Christ anymore. And eventually the entire sign was covered and the dwindling church was closed. We preach Christ crucified must be the anthem of every person who pretends or declares to be a preacher. This is what Spurgeon said. The motto of all true servants of God must be, we preach Christ and him crucified. A sermon without Christ in it is like a loaf of bread without any flour in it. All the celiacs get really offended at that. Back in his day, gluten-free wasn't a... This is... It's an analogy. He says, no Christ in your sermon, sir? Then go home and never preach again until you have something worth preaching. If you have a sermon prepared for tomorrow, pastors, if you're in this room and it doesn't have an explicit declaration of the good news of God's love in Christ on the cross through his bloodletting atonement and a call to repentance for sinners who are still at enmity with God, repent, edit it, preach a whole sermon on that. Your church probably needs it. Spurgeon said, leave Christ out of a sermon? Oh, my brothers, you better leave the pulpit out altogether. If a man can preach even one sermon without mentioning Christ's name in it, it ought to be his last. Certainly the last that any Christian ought to go hear him preach. So pastors, let every single sermon that you deliver give explicit gospel articulation and the calling of people to have faith in Jesus Christ. What in the world else would you rather preach about? Christians... Go to a church that preaches Christ crucified. This is not a question of, of, of niche or of style. I was to told by a, uh, a, a, a leader in, a, in Christian ministry a while ago. He says, there's something I like about you. It's unique. It's sort of your personality trait. But you often talk about the, salva uh, about the cross. That's neat. Like, it's hard to say thanks to that. That's a, that's a low, low bar. Like, you know I'm a pastor, right? In fact, you're probably complimenting me on that or encouraging it on the wrong basis. You're thinking, that, that's a cool thing for me to do. Right? You're about the spirit or, or you're about the fruit or, or you're about something else, like leadership techniques. But, but I'm about the cross. I, I don't think there's categories to think that way at all. Therefore, I've told people before, you need to be at a church that preaches the cross. One, uh, not one, many, but some, uh, recently somebody told me, well, I'm at a church and they, they don't really preach the gospel of grace. I says, what do you mean? Well, technically, he's not a big believer in justification by faith alone in Christ alone, right? And this guy was sort of understanding the five souls. He goes, now, I know my church doesn't necessarily hold to that, and I want to come to your church. What is your wisdom? How long should I take? He says, brother, you need to move churches now because that gathering you're going to isn't a church, 
says, well, well, well wouldn't, I be, wouldn't I be improper to just quickly leave? Like, is it necessarily a sin to try and stay and reform? And says, yes, because you're neglecting the gathering of the saints. You're not going to a lesser church if your pastor preaches against the gospel of grace. You're in a synagogue of Satan. You haven't been going to church for 10 years. You're in sin. Leave quickly if your church doesn't really believe in that old, old stuff about Jesus on a cross and exclusive salvation and you need faith and eternal hell and blah, blah, blah. Leave. You're not at church. Or maybe you're at a church that is gospel agnostic. Right? It's gospel as You're not really sure. Like, you haven't heard the gospel. I think a couple of Easter's ago, they did say, they, they, yeah, there was a cross themed um, a sermon back then. That was really nice. That was, that was cute. I'm not sure whether they do or don't believe in the atonement or justification. We, that's not the sort of thing we teach about. Leave that gathering immediately. I'm sick of being in church ministry and trying to pontificate and layer all of my exhortation towards Christians with so much nuance that I end up having blood on my hands, leave that church immediately. Somebody said to me recently, don't I owe my pastor an explanation? I said, you owe Jesus an explanation. Tolerating a gathering without the proclamation of Jesus? Now, some of you, maybe, maybe anybody who's thinking, oh, is that my church? Maybe you fall into this third category, which is, that the preaching of the gospel is there. The, the pastor says it, but it, it, it lacks much power. Like he mentions it. And it's a suggestion. And maybe today you would even consider how maybe Jesus could be right for you. And, and, and if you're interested, and I don't want to force anything on you, but, but if the eternal God man dying in flesh for your sins is, is something that is... Yeah, like if eternity in hell um, me, me, is, is worth... Um, we... God bless you. We'd love to talk to you about it maybe afterwards. No pressure. Um, God bless you. So maybe, maybe the gospel's there. Like he even mentions justification, but you're just sitting here thinking, I wish it was revival type preaching. I wish it was more powerful than your obligation starting this afternoon is to take up the ministry of prayer and encouragement for your pastor and be the fire beneath them. Pray that God would revive them. Stoke them. The gospel is there. It needs the power. Pray and encourage your pastor towards that end. Prioritize the preaching of the gospel. No revival. Also, know your history. Know your hi- This is what can you do to get out of the way of hindering revival and, and prayerfully expect it in a right frame and right posture. Know your history. And I'm so thankful for Dr. Damon Sessions and, and something he said in there. Know your history as a spiritual discipline. B- because history, like providence, is our diary, he said. Uh, I know you quoted somebody else, but I will from now on be quoting Dr. Damon when I say that. One of the Puritans, Dr. Damon, real doctor. Can I just make a point? When you, people have been getting, when you say Dr. Craig, it's Dr. Craig. Like you have to do the air quotes. It's like it was a pity... When Dr. Craig first said, uh, no. <clears throat> history is God's, it's his story. Church history is our family history, and we need to know it as a spiritual discipline. Judges 2 verse 10 could rightly identify the last couple of generations in Australian evangelicalism. All that generation were gathered to their fathers. They were buried. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done. How many of us are sitting here going, my spiritual forefathers labored on this land? There was revival in Brisbane, on Albert Street, in Toowoomba? This was happening here? Why have I not heard of this? Will you realize that you stand as a link in a very long spiritual chain? Maybe for some of us it's even a bloodline because it was your grandfather, your great-grandfathers who came and labored as missionaries or pastors or intercessors. I think that learning Australian Christian history, it's, it can kind of be imaged as, as, as I like share stories and these things with members of my church or other people and their eyes are lighting up going, in this country? 
In this nation, these things were happening. And, and it's as if they're, they're realizing that connected to their, to their waist is this thing they've never seen before. And it's this chain that leads backwards into history through this long linkage of all of these great saints of men and women in the past. But, but for the last few generations, it has been covered by sand. And so learning history is like uncovering that and realizing where you've come from. What lineage, what spiritual mothers and fathers you owe your honor to. Know your history so that it may stir you. Hebrews 11 gives to us divine uh, uh, precedent of the merit of biography. Hebrews 11, the great uh, hall of fame, the great uh, uh, list of all of the, those who have lived and died in their faith and wrought great things for the kingdom. Paul, or whoever wrote Hebrews, uses Hebrews 11 as a stirring biography, knowing that if we know what has happened in the past, we can say Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. He may do the same thing among us today. John Piper, in that great book, if you get it, 27 Servants of Sovereign Joy, I recommend it to you. Yeah, especially if you're starting out your reading journey, it's an enormous book, but it's 27 mini books on biographies, and it would be a great on-ramp for you for further biography and reading. He says this, the unmistakable implication of chapter 11 in Hebrews is that if we hear about the faith of our forefathers and mothers, we will then do what Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, which is, lay aside every weight and sin and run with endurance the race set before us. If we ask the author of the Hebrews, how shall we stir one another to love and good works? His answer might be, through encouragement from the living, do not neglect the gathering together, and encouragement from the dead, look at their lives. The reality of Christian history gives life to Hebrews 11 when it says, of Abel, through his faith, though he died, yet he still speaks. I could use like one historical example of, of God uses biography to stir us so that we knowing our history, we can know our God better and then labor likewise. There's one man by the name of David Brainerd. He died. If you, if you know him, that name brings to your heart a gravity and, and a love of God's mission. He, he was a young man in America. He died at the ripe old age of 29 of tuberculosis after about only four years of mission work. And he died in the house of Jonathan Edwards. It says this. Day, uh, John Piper says in that book that I've recommended to you, David Brainerd would probably not be known by anyone today if it were not for Jonathan Edwards. He was lined up to go through one of the most prestigious uh, seminaries and then get the most prestigious job offer for ministers back in their day in the Hamptons of New York. Uh, and he got kicked out of his seminary training because he basically cussed out a professor in his youthful zeal, saying that he didn't think his professor was saved. He had no more grace than a chair, is what he said, and that, which is a great line. But in the 1700s, that's like, you're almost breaking the law with how, how crass that kind of language is. So he was kicked out, and instead of being well-known and well-documented, he was known by nearly no one and became a missionary to the largely untapped swaths of souls known as the Indians, the indigenous Americans. But Jonathan Edwards undertook to edit and publish David Brainerd's private journal of his mission endeavors. As an act of devotion to Brainerd and to the great cause of world evangelization that his life stood for. The reverberations for the sake of world missions in the following 250 years have been incalculable. This book has never been out of print. On his dying bed... Edwards it, it convinces, at straining this dying man to agree to let Edwards publish his private journals of all of his endeavors with the Indians. And finally, he allowed him to do it. Almost immediately published, after it was published, it challenged the spirit of God's great adventurers. Gideon Hawley, one of Edwards' missionary protégés, carried it in his saddlebag as the only other book besides his Bible as, as he traveled among the Indians. 
The rise of modern Protestant missionary movement took good inspiration from Edwards and Brainerd. For example, in the 1800s in India, William Carey drew up a covenant for his missionary band that included the words, we will always look to Brainerd. The, light, the list of missionaries who testified to the inspiration of Jonathan Edwards' influence through the labor of love that he expended in writing this book of, of David Brainerd is longer than any of us knows. The list of people who, who, who attribute that book as to why they were in ministry is longer than we know. Francis Asbury, Thomas Coke, William Carey, Henry Martin, Robert Morrison, Samuel Mills, Frederick Schwartz, Robert McShane, David Livingston, Andrew Murray, and more attribute that book to either why they entered the ministry or the mission field or what kept them going at their moments of failure. Could it be, maybe at this conference, God stirs in you a love of history, a love of reading history, so that you seek to learn more and know God's work in our land. So that this might create in you a devotion to God's cause. Maybe you enter the ministry because of this. Maybe you go on missions because of this. Or you become useful in the coming revival that God will send. Know your history and be shaped by its study. Also, if we need to know what revival really is, we need to prioritize preaching of Christ, we need to know your history. Also, let us say, as it's been said so often this weekend already, know how to pray. Know how to pray. I said last night, revival is little more than Christ in his threefold office as prophet, priest, and king, simply applying his mediation to the world. That as prophet, he is giving his life-giving word empowered from heaven to souls on earth. As priest, he is applying his sacrificial blood to souls which saves them. And as king, he taught us to enter his throne room and petition for his kingdom to come. This is the power of revival. Jesus is the power of revival, so plead with him. Matthew Henry said, it's quoted earlier from Chris, when God, sets, when God intends to give a blessing to his people, the first thing he does in them is to set them a praying. It's not as if we pray, then God does something. God leads us to prayer, and after a season of prayer, then he gives us his blessings. Maybe, and this would be the injunction, you and your whole church should prioritize prayer, but that's a mammoth task to go and just change your church. Maybe you can't start with your whole church. Maybe you just need to find some friends. Like John Watsford, who became a revivalist in Australia, the first homegrown, Australian-born Methodist missionary it, before he was being used for mighty works in later years. In 1840s, he was uh, 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 just him and a couple of friends not long after being saved. There was just two of them, just a small group who decided to pray on certain afternoons and Saturdays. And then in the lead off from that, off of the ramp of that, there was a great outpouring at his, uh, in his local prayer meeting and worship service which brought forth the salvation of hundreds. Maybe you can just find a, fruit, a few at your church. doesn't need to be pastor sanctioned, doesn't need to be official, just gather with some friends to pray weekly. Maybe not a group. Maybe you can only gather one other person. And in that you might be like Peggy and Christine Smith, the elderly 80-year-old women, one of them blind, in the New Hebrides of Scotland, who set themselves to praying frequently, nightly, 10 till 3 a.m., I think was their timing of prayers. And eventually the elders of the church got wind of it and caught some revival desire. And then shortly after, God sent Duncan Campbell to their church and revival struck them and thousands were swept into the kingdom. Maybe you can only find one other. Or maybe you can't find anybody else in your church to pray. And in this, you might be like Abraham, who wrestles with God, saying, if for the sake of ten righteous, won't you spare Sodom? Maybe you pray to God alone, and he will hear, and he will heal. Here's some features of ineffective prayer. I'm just going to go through them rather quickly. Features of ineffective prayer. I've been praying. Why has nothing happened? Well, first of all, pride. Isaiah 57 verse 15 says, 
Thus says the Holy One who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. He says, I dwell in the high and holy place. And also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. God dwells in the highest of places and the lowest of places and nowhere in between. He is in the high and uplifted heaven and he is with the broken heart. He says to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. The humble and the contrite will receive God's blessing in prayer. Formality. Jesus says in Matthew verse 6 and 7, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do. If you've gone through Nepal or to India or you've gone down to a local Buddhist temple uh, that we might have here in Australia, regrettably, and you hear them praying, now maybe it's another language and that's a part of it, but it's just the repetition of single phrases, hoping that one of them spurts off in a tangent and finds its way to the heavenly realm where the gods are, and if you're lucky, they might listen long enough to possibly send you a blessing. We don't heap up our phrases in hope that by the grand uh, uh, tower of Babel that we make with our words that God will bless it. We pray with few words sometimes, knowing that God is our Father. That's why he prays. Some of us are praying with so many words, so many long uh, uh, theological words and concepts, and we're sort of just preaching and eloquently lecturing in our prayers so that other people listen and That's just as empty phrases piled up as Gentiles or pagans. Don't pray with formality. Don't pray unpurposefully. That is, without a particular goal or aim in mind. Pray purposefully, specifically. Read Paul's uh, letters to the New Testament church and how specific he got with prayer requests. Please pray that a door would be open to me to speak the gospel so that people get saved. Specific things. Pray for specific things. Lord, please help conversions to happen this weekend at our church. Please help our pastor to be upheld in his preaching. Please help uh, uh, these people in our church to have these needs met. Pray specifically. To pray unspecifically is really just to veil the next sin, which is praying unexpectantly. You know, prayers are very general, generic and vague. Lord, if you would just bless and give and just be, be a blessing to your people, O oh God. Amen. We're not expecting any answer to that because we will have no clue what that looks like if it's answered. When we pray specifically, we are praying expectantly. And James tells us that when you ask, ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. What about short-lived prayer? Oh, we may start praying, but then we stop praying. Jesus said in Luke 18, uh, Jesus told a parable in Luke 18. He told them a parable to the effect that they should ought always pray and not lose heart. Or maybe we are praying upon things not found in God's promises. That's the next part. Know God's promises. Be familiar with God's promises. Like, for example, what, what uh, James uh, uh, mentioned to us and preached about that Christ will build his church. Here is a heaven-sent promise to you through the God-man's mouth. I will build my church and the gates of hell can never, ever stand against it. Pray according to that. God, build your church through Christ in this day and in this age, in this gathering, wherever you are in your church tomorrow. Maybe pray, uh, uh, remembering the promises of Jesus in Luke 11. I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks it will be opened. Ask expecting an answer from God. Or one a Puritan uh, wrote upon Jesus' words in John 17. In John 17, Jesus is closing out his prayer to God for, uh, for the, the believers and the church in the world. And he ends his, uh, gets towards the end of his prayer like this. Father, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This Puritan then has this whole sermon saying, well, if Jesus has promised his father, he didn't even promise you, it's more holy than that. 
Jesus promised his Holy Father that he would reveal his name again to people in the world. So, so take your suburb, take your nation, take your state, take your church and go to the throne room as if you have a divine warrant and say to Jesus, you said you would make your name known and you have not yet in my suburb. And you have not yet to these families. Would you, Lord Jesus, make your ma- name known here, anywhere you go on earth? There is a nation, and all nations have within them those that God will save. You can say, Jesus, you said you would make your name known again. Please do it here. Pray according to promises. Of all of the preparations that we make or these things, and I'm sure a wiser, more experienced person might have even even more, more potent things that we might be able to put in place in our life to then expect revival with us out of the way. Let me at least... Say this, repent. Repent. There's some preaching about repentance and allowing God, uh, uh, you know, toler- uh, uh, permitting God to have the power to do what he wants to do in your life. And to do that, you need to sort of find out what your great grand auntie or your grandma or your father, what sort of generational sin you've inherited and, and sort of search that. Maybe you swore and cussed once when you were four, hasn't been asked for repentance yet. And if you get rid of that, then you'll be a pure vessel. I, I, none of that is biblical. But also all of that is so irrelevant compared to our known sin. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but we all have some, some sin, some, some thing, some area in our life, something we need to go home, gentlemen, and repent to our wives tonight and say, I've not led properly. I'm sorry for my weakness. I'm starting this week of praying and leading the family. Wives might need to say to their husbands, I've been disrespectful. I've not been uh, godly. Please forgive me. Pastors need to say to their, to their, their congregations tomorrow, I'm sorry for not preaching Christ enough. Here's a new dose. What we look at online, what we tolerate in our entertainment, what we permit in our speech, what thing are you doing? I've been a pastor long enough to know that people are always more unholy than you hope. And it's always unguessable the things they're doing. Like if I stood here, um, maybe 200 people, and I just made a list of 200 types of sins that there might be going on, it'd be weirder, it'd be darker, it'd be stranger. Like Paul the Apostle is a pastor in Ephesus for, for going on a year and then he finds out there's a, that a whole half of his congregation or thereabouts was still doing black magic? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Whatever it is, I, I don't know, but God knows. And you know what? You know. Like repent and you say, oh, what of? No, th- that thing. The thing that makes you go, what else should I, that, that, that thing in your life, that toleration, that sin, get it out. For our cowardice and fear of man, for our neglect of God's means and our being at ch- uh, not being at church, for, for our prayerlessness, let us repent and clarify and purify the altar of our hearts so that God can send the fire. Maybe even before all of those things, we should say again, be ye reconciled to God. That's all. That's KJV English. Let's get real basic. You be reconciled now to God. Maybe this is where revival starts. With the salvation of John Watsford in the 1840s, which led to revivals in the decades to follow. Maybe, maybe you're the one that God will use for revival next. But, but you don't give your life to Jesus for that sake. You give your life to Jesus. You believe and trust on the merits of his blood shed at Calvary so, because God commands you to. He has shed forth his love, holds out his son, be saved today. Don't don't face God as judge when you can face him as saviour. Come to Jesus and be saved. In all these things, let me recap. It's so hard to put all of these things into, into a single address on what feels to me at least a very short weekend. But let us say again, know what revival is. Pursue and prioritize the preaching of Christ. Know your church history. Know how to pray. Know the promises of God. Repent of known sin and be saved if you are not yet. I want to close this conference, at least before we sing to the Lord Jesus Christ in worship. I want to close the speaking uh, uh, portion, giving Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, the last word. And he was preaching this on the text of Jesus declaring, I am the light of the world. And he, uh, he was preaching it 
really to the, uh, against the consideration of many who would be pessimistic in their view of history as it regards the success of the Great Commission. There were some people who would say, so negative will be the end of the world history, that the Great Commission will in fact fall and fail. Now, some was mentioned of eschatology earlier, and I would say that Spurgeon's no post-millennialist. He's a historic premillennialist. If you know what it means, then that's interesting. If you don't, that not matter. But here's what he said, and to this I hardly agree, and I hope you do too. He says this, I cannot believe that this dispensation will be wound up as a tremendous failure, that the gospel zealously preached everywhere shall result in only a few being saved, and that the whole economy shall go out in darkness as the snuff of a candle is extinguished. No, I look for better things. Those who dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him. At this point, he's just piling up Old Testament prophecies. And his enemies shall lick the dust. The islands shall bring him tribute. Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yes, all kings shall fall down before Christ. I cannot help but believing that the gospel is yet to be triumphant. I look for the coming of Christ. Yes, let him come when he may. Our hearts will leap for joy to greet him. But... For this age to end without success would seem to me like the thwarting of the purposes of God. That is not his way in the world. He has entered into battle with Satan deliberately, choosing poor, feeble instruments like ourselves to confound the forces confronted against him. And if he should then withdraw them all, have them lose, and then himself come to the front and take up the fight single-handedly with his chosen legions, which his chosen legions could not conduct, it would look to me as if he had not wisely foreseen the engagement, or he had needed to alter his plans to pursue his ends. No, the Spirit inspires feebleness with irresistible force upon his church. Moreover, he keeps on sending fresh battalions, he raises up new troops, and every now and then when the battle seems to waver, he recruits the ranks and sends them out new enlistments of souls, strengthening the ranks that are thinned and harassing the enemy with his reserves. Here's how he closes out. Courage, my brethren! There shall be revival after revival. There shall be reformation after reformation, shock of battle after shock of battle, and the dread artillery of God's great gospel shall be fired off against all the hosts of hell. The gods of the heathen shall fall. Antichrist shall be overthrown. Babylon shall sink like a millstone in the flood. The crescent of Muhammad and Islam must wane into eternal darkness. Israel will behold her king, and the fullness of the Gentiles shall be gathered at his feet. So let us, let our faith excite our courage, and our courage stimulate our patience, and our patience give zest to the full assurance of hope while we worship our Lord Jesus Christ as the light of the world. Amen. You close your eyes with me and actually be upstanding before we have our uh, uh, last portion from the MCs and the singing to Christ. Let us pray together. Father God, you have sent your Son to be the light of the world. He is the way and the truth and the life, and there will be none that come to you if not by his name and through him. There will be no hope for this world unless by the preaching of Jesus, the church is empowered by your spirit to see many souls added. We believe in this, that if the sovereign, miraculous work of the Holy Spirit did not continually replenish the ranks of Christ's army, the church would die in a single generation. Thank you for the promise that that will never happen that your witness would not be entirely taken out of this world and that the church will endure until she is finally finished, the completed temple of the Holy Spirit in the world. We pray for these things, Lord God. We ask that you would move us out of the way, that you would let us decrease so that Christ may increase, that his gospel shall be proclaimed all canons blazing throughout our nation so that Christ is seen heard, believed upon in the world as he is taken up in glory. Father God, we pray all of these things through his 
marvelous, triumphant name and through the promises of his gospel. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.